outside of the Senate is in today working on Democratic leader Harry Reid's bill dealing with the debt and deficit. Book TV will resume when the Senate goes into recess. You can watch Book TV programming anytime online. Org. The Senate is expected to vote on moving forward with Senator Reid's measure in about an hour. His plan cuts the deficit by $2.4 trillion over 10 years, sets up a congressional committee to recommend more cuts, and raises the debt ceiling in three stages. Live coverage here on C-SPAN 2. Us, oh God, for the waters are coming in upon us. We are weary from the struggle, tempted to throw in the towel, but quitting isn't an option. Today, fill our lawmakers with the spirit of your wisdom guiding their footsteps to a desired destination. Draw near to them and deliver them from evil for the kingdom, the power, and the glory belong to you. You are our strength and shield, and our hearts can safely trust in you. Save your people and bless their inheritance. We pray in your strong name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, uh, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., July 31, 2011, to the Senate. Under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Richard Blumenthal, a senator from the state of Connecticut, to perform the duties of the chair. Signed, Daniel K. Inouye, President Pro Tempore. Mr. President. The Majority Leader. Following any leader remarks, the Senate will resume consideration of the motion to occur in the House message to accompany, accompany S-627 which is a legislative vehicle for the debt limit increase at the time until 1 p.m. equally divided. At about 1 p.m. then, the Senate will vote on the motion and vote cloture on the motion to concur with the House message with the Reid Amendment. Uh, no matter the outcome of this vote, Mr. President, the message will still be before this body. Uh, this is the, if there is an agreement that can be met, that this is a vehicle that will be used to send it back to the House. Mr. President, as the clock ticks down to August 2nd, I want to remind everyone within the sound of my voice what really is at stake. This very moment, millions of seniors across this great country worry that their next Social Security check might not come to them on Wednesday. Middle class families wonder whether their retirement accounts will be wiped out by an economic collapse brought on by default on this nation's debt. An active military personnel including many who are risking their lives for our great nation, worry whether they will receive their paychecks. Associated Press reported that Admiral Mike Mullen, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, visited with troops serving in Afghanistan yesterday. And the soldiers Admiral Mullen talked with weren't asked about military strategy or how a troop drawdown in Afghanistan would affect them. No, they asked whether they would get paid if Republicans forced the United States government stop paying its bills. In a region that has been rocked by violence and plagued by suicide bombers this month, they wondered how they would take care of the families if the checks stopped coming next month. Let me read a little bit of that United Press story that came out yesterday. Quote, half a world away from the Capitol, the Capitol Hill deadlock, the economy and debt crisis are weighing heavily on U.S. troops in Afghanistan. And the top question on their minds Saturday, even as bombings rocked the city around them, was one the top United States military officer couldn't answer. Will we get paid? End of quote. 
Admiral Mullen went on to say, I don't know the answer to that question, but that either way, those soldiers, he said, all of you must continue to work every day. Mr. President, this is really unacceptable. A country as rich and powerful as ours, men and women with bombs going off around them, shouldn't worry whether this country will leave them high and dry. This afternoon, I ask those who have said they will never compromise on any terms to think about who their stubbornness will really hurt, seniors, soldiers, and others. I've spoken to the Vice President this morning, in fact, a couple of times. He's hopeful. Of course, we have to be hopeful that we're close to agreement with Republican leaders. The framework of this agreement is based on new ideas and sold ideas. After speaking to Republican leader Mitch McConnell this morning, we are cautiously optimistic. There are a number of issues yet to be resolved, and we must understand that. There's no agreement that has been made, but we're optimistic that one can be reached. But we're not there yet. And optimism in days past has been really stomped on in various times. These major issues still to be resolved. Are these ongoing discussions is something we have to resolve in the next few hours if they're going to be resolved. Each of them must be resolved before we have a final agreement. And as we know, one problem can stop the whole agreement from going forward. But we must get something done as quickly as possible. I believe all sides are aware of this urgency. It's unfortunate that the House of Representatives wasted all last week on legislation they knew would never pass the Senate, and in fact, barely passed the House. It passed the House with only Republican votes, not a single Democratic vote. Democrats have said all along that we would never agree to a short-term arrangement that would put our economy at risk and force Congress into another debt ceiling showdown in a few weeks. We have to move on. The House major took the debt ceiling for five months, August, September, October, November, and December, five months. We would be back in this same debate in a matter of weeks. We could not allow that to happen. So any agreement has to have a long-term approach. That's the long-term approach that we've taken here in the Senate, is, that we've forced here in the Senate is absolutely necessary. We must give the financial markets confidence this country won't shirk its obligations now or in the future. I know that the compromise being discussed at the White House adopts the Senate's long-term approach, which will give the economy the certainty it needs. Take us past the year, uh, again, past January 2013. That has to be done, and that will be done if an agreement is reached. It's also crucial the agreement being crafted set us on the path to fiscal restraint. Mr. President, there are still elements to be resolved, and we're watching them very closely. The settlement must include thoughtful constraints on spending. We know that. The 12 member commission I conceived to recommend additional deficit reduction measures this year will be a key to that effort. And I say to my friend, the Republican leader, I appreciate his uh, wrapping his arms around this and being such a cheerleader for this idea. It's a good idea. It's an idea that Congress itself would solve the problem. It would be a joint committee that would move forward, and there would be a trigger that if they didn't resolve this, then something else would happen. And uh, based on past experiences, I think there would be tremendous incentive not to let that certain thing happen when the trigger kicked in. So Senator McConnell and I agree the Commission owns the responsibility to set this country on the path to fiscal accountability. The Joint Committee, there are no constraints. It can look at any program we have in government, any program. Any, it has the ability to look at everything, and that's what needs to be done. The Commission will assure we undertake that responsibility. When I thought of this idea about the Commission, I knew it was important that it achieve real results. And it will be essential to choose members with all their minds willing to consider every option, even when the options are tough pills to swallow for both parties. So, Mr. President, cooperation is the only way forward. Compromise is the only way forward. This is what Andrew Carnegie said about the virtue of compromise. Quote, I shall argue that strong men, and since the Senate's changed so dramatically, 
and strong women. That's me. I stuck that in. I shall argue that strong men know when to compromise and that all principles can be compromised to serve a greater principle. Andrew Carnegie. But perhaps President Abraham Lincoln said it best when he said this, and I quote, determine that the thing can and shall be done, and then we shall find the way. That's where we are today, Mr. President. We must determine that the thing can and shall be done, and then we need to find that way. That's President Abraham Lincoln. Would the chair announce the business for the day? Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will resume consideration of the House message to accompany S627, which the clerk will report. Motion to concur in the House Amendment to S627, an act to establish the Commission on Freedom of Information Act processing delays with an amendment. Under the previous order, the time until 1 p.m. shall be equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees. The clerk will call the roll. Without objection. Mr. President. Senator from Maryland. Are we in a quorum call? We are not. Mr. President, uh, let me uh, first uh, compliment the majority leader. I think he said it accurately. And that is we need to find a compromise uh, between where we are so we can move forward with the uh, increasing the debt limit and, and a credible plan to reduce the, the deficit. And I've heard many of my colleagues talk about that. But I just really want to point out that Leader Reed's proposal that we will be voting cloture in a few moments is a compromise. It includes two major provisions that the Republicans have been asking about that, quite frankly, many Democrats disagree with. First, there will be dollar-for-dollar dollar reduction in spending for the increase in the debt ceiling. Now, let me tell you, there is no relationship between the debt ceiling and spending. The debt ceiling represents funds that have already been committed that we have an obligation to pay. And we all understand what would happen if we violated the debt ceiling. It would affect the credit of America, it's standing internationally, the dollar's uh, global significance. It would affect our credit worthiness in, in, in America, increase the cost of government borrowing, increase the taxes for uh, the, the spending for all taxpayers in this country, would have effects in my own state of Maryland. We've been told that the Maryland bond rating is very much tied to the federal bond rating, and it could very well 
cause a downgrade for, for Maryland taxpayers, increased costs for, for mortgages, for credit cards. Every family would be affected. So the Reid bill yields to what the Republicans have asked, and that although there's no relationship to the debt ceiling uh, and the spending, because these are bills that have already been incurred, there's dollar for dollar reduction in spending for every dollar increase in the debt. The, the second major concession that Democrats have already made in the Reid proposal is that there's no revenues in this. Now, we've been talking a long time, if we're going to have a credible plan to reduce the deficit, we have to include all of the elements of federal spending. And we have a lot of what we call tax expenditures, monies that are spent in our tax code. Some of these dollars are spent on shelters and loopholes that we should close. I've taken the floor several times to talk about several of these loopholes, the ethanol credit that, uh, that we should not be given uh, for ethanol subsidies, the, the, the funds that go to gas and oil companies. There are a lot of loopholes in our tax code that we could close. The re-proposal has made an accommodation to the Republicans to say, okay, you said that's a deal killer, that's not in the Reid proposal. So the Reid proposal is the largest amount of deficit reduction, $2.4 trillion of deficit reduction for $2.4 trillion of debt, in, debt ceiling increase so we can get through March of next year, or March of 2013, March of the year after that. That gives us the stability we need. And we know what we've gone through already as far as this debt ceiling debate. It's already hurt our country. We don't want to go through this again. And that's what I think is critically important by moving forward to get this done. Now, Mr. Mr. President, we're going to have a vote in about 45 minutes. And that vote is on cloture. And I want to explain to you, I know Senator Levin talked about it yesterday. What the Republicans are doing is they're filibustering the debt limit bill. That's what it is. It's a filibuster. They're requiring us now to, to develop, have 60 votes rather than a simple majority. Now, the, the, the Speaker of the House, Speaker Boehner, passed his proposal in the House with a majority of those voting. Now, that's what democracy should be about. And we're talking about the debt limit increase and whether it is a type of issue that should be filibustered by the Republicans. They're doing that. They're filibustering it, and their vote in a few moments will determine whether they believe we should be able to move forward without a 60-vote threshold. Now, the majority leader has pointed out that on previous occasions, we have taken up the debt ceiling, and we have not required a 60-vote threshold. I, I have my staff pull the information about the debt votes that we had when George W. Bush were president. We had one on June 28th. No requirement for a 60-vote threshold. We had another on May 27, 2003. It passed the Senate by a 53-44 vote. No filibuster of that by the Democrats. We had a vote on November 19, 2004, where the debt ceiling was increased by $800 billion. The vote was 52 to 44 in the Senate. Again, no effort made to require a 60-vote threshold. No, no effort made to filibuster that issue. And then again, on September 29, 2007, the debt ceiling was increased by $850 billion by a vote of 53 to 42. Once again, no effort made to filibuster that issue. Webster's Dictionary defines filibuster as the use of extreme dilatory tactics to delay or prevent action by the majority in a legislative or deliberative assembly. That's exactly what the Republicans are doing if they vote against the cloture motion in a few moments. They're using extreme dilatory tactics to deny the majority the opportunity to take up an issue. I know that we're close to working out an agreement. I certainly hope we work out an agreement on this. I've been saying on the floor of the Senate for a long time that Democrats and Republicans need to put the nation's interests first. We have two goals, increase the debt ceiling and a credible plan to deal with the deficit. The Reid proposal offers uh, solutions to both of those goals. I hope we have a bipartisan agreement before the day is out and we can move forward. 
But I think it's critically important that the members of the Senate express whether they believe we should be filibustering a debt limit increase. I believe that is not the right precedent for this, for this body to do. We should always allow the debt ceiling to be increased by a majority vote. That's what they did in the House of Representatives. That's what we should be doing in the United States Senate. And I would urge my colleagues to vote for the cloture motion, but let us continue this discussion because in order to get a bill to the President's desk, we know we're going to have to reach further compromises. We understand that. We've had, I think, some, 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 some discussions among our colleagues here, and I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to reach that type of a compromise. We have a chance in a few minutes to move forward to, to that we express ourselves that we should be doing this in the Senate by majority vote. I urge my colleagues to support cloture. I urge my colleagues to support the, the Reid um, uh, proposal. And then I would ask unanimous consent that during the quorum call time be equally divided between the Democratic time and the Republican time. Without objection. And with that, I would suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Mr. President. From Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection, the Senator from Connecticut is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I would like to join others of my colleagues in thanking and commending the Majority Leader, Senator Reid, for his tireless and relentless work in extraordinarily difficult circumstances. He has been a model for me as a new member of the Senate in leading this body and many of my other Democratic colleagues and the leadership and some of our Republican colleagues as well. Senator Johnny Isaacson, for example, of Georgia, who spoke to this chamber yesterday morning and who demonstrated his determination, as others on the other side of the aisle have done, to work together in reaching an agreement. As the majority leader said just moments ago, the word of the day must be cooperation and compromise. It is the word that we are hearing from countless Americans and my fellow citizens of Connecticut day after day. We want you to get the job done. Put aside the partisan differences. America is speaking with one voice and Washington must listen. You know, I am new to Washington. I haven't been here for long. I've just marked my first six months in the United States Senate. But I understand more and more why my fellow Connecticut citizens and Americans are so frustrated and often appalled by what goes on here. This situation is outrageous. We have an impending crisis, self-created, and devastating possible wounds, self-inflicted, and Washington has been deadlocked. Deadlock. There is a glimmer of hope, a reason to be cautiously optimistic. The solution is in sight, but still work to be done. And Washington needs to end the gridlock, the straitjacket that has been self-imposed, and to take action to protect citizens from financial catastrophe. Our nation really is at a crossroads, and we need to rein in spending cut the debt and the deficit, make the tough choices necessary to get our fiscal house in order, and we need to do it now. 
The fiscal news in the last few days, the anemic and fragile measures of recovery show more than ever why we need now certainty that ending this deadlock will produce. Uncertainty is the enemy. It's the enemy for businesses that are deciding whether to hire, for banks wanting to loan money to those businesses, for larger corporations sitting on mountains of cash waiting to invest and create jobs. Jobs and our economy are the main reasons to make these tough choices literally today, to make these tough choices now. We have a historic moment and we must seize it. And we cannot keep kicking these decisions down the road. Families in Connecticut and across the country make these tough choices every day. And they rightfully expect nothing less from us. Tough choices are necessary to help get our debt and our deficit under control. I've heard as late as this morning, Sunday morning, from hundreds of Connecticut residents who are frustrated and appalled at what is going on here, what they see in Washington, D.C. Bernice from Tallinn, Connecticut, she can't believe we don't have an agreement. And she's worried she won't receive her Social Security check next month. And Jane from West Hartford, she's wondering why we're protecting sweetheart deals instead of ensuring Social Security is protected and strengthen. And Rod from New Milford, he just wants us to compromise and to get something done to end this nightmare. I agree with them and hundreds of others from Connecticut and around the country who want to make sure that those troops in Afghanistan are paid, that their families are taken care of, and I thank the citizens of Connecticut for calling or writing to me. I agree that the immediate solution and agree with them, is not only to raise the debt ceiling, but also to cut spending. As the Reid proposal makes clear, dollar for dollar to match every increase in that debt ceiling, without tax increases, none, without any cuts in Medicare or Social Security, none. Those basic principles in the Reid proposal are what should be embodied in what the outcome is of this debate. The markets need a real solution, not a short-term fix, to demonstrate that we're committed to achieving real results in cutting spending. Anne from Hamden in Connecticut makes this point powerfully. She just called yesterday to say a short-term plan would not provide the certainty the markets are desperately seeking, and I agree. No short-term plan can provide that kind of certainty. It risks a credit rating downgrade and ensures that we will be back here in another six months. And as much as we may criticize the rating agency, and I have been one to criticize them most vehemently as an attorney general of my state of Connecticut and now as a member of this body, we must deal with that reality at this moment and take action down the road to address the need for reform. Credit rating and agencies downgrades seem abstract and intangible, but they are hugely consequential. A downgrade in our credit rating would likely cause, in effect, an automatic tax increase in the form of higher interest rates for every American who has a mortgage, a car loan, a student debt, or a credit card. And the American people deserve better. Coming together to compromise is essential now. Majority Leader Reid has proposed a solution that meets all of the criteria that House Republicans have demanded for weeks. It doesn't raise taxes or revenues. It includes enough spending to meet the debt ceiling increase dollar for dollar. And it includes spending cuts that are the same, the very same as our Republican colleagues, our friends across the aisle, have previously voted for and supported over these past weeks. And most importantly, Senator Reid's plan makes tough spending cuts, but doesn't balance the budget on the backs of our seniors or our most vulnerable. It protects vital programs and does not make cuts 
to benefits to Medicare and Social Security. And I can pledge again, as I have repeatedly, that I will oppose cuts in Medicare or Social Security. Time and again, Democrats have shown that we are willing to compromise to avert catastrophe and default. Unfortunately, at every turn, Republicans in the House have blocked any chance for progress and continue to put us in a very dangerous path. I am hopeful that the deadline will produce a compromise, that the talks will be productive, but today's filibuster of our efforts to prevent a default is indeed unprecedented. As my colleague, the distinguished, very distinguished senator from Maryland, has pointed out just a few moments ago on the floor, since March of 1962, Congress has raised the debt limit 74 times, 18 times under President Reagan. During George Bush's administration, Congress passed five standalone debt limit increases without a filibuster or delay. And until today, until this point, debt limit increases were routine, usually passed by a simple 51 vote majority without the procedural hur hurdles that my Republican colleagues are using today. They need to come to the table, and hopefully they will continue to be at the table to work with us to find a compromise for the good of the country and the good of our economic recovery. So I hope that my Republican colleagues will join us in achieving that result for the sake of millions of Connecticut families who are watching and listening as are hundreds of millions of Americans and for the sake of our economy moving in the right direction. It is about jobs, jobs, jobs. The certainty that our economy needs at this point in its history, affordable interest rates to move our economy forward. Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Illinois, insist the majority leader. Thank the Senator from Connecticut for his comments and for his focus on jobs. If you ask the American people, the most important thing we face, it's jobs, creating good paying jobs right here in the United States so families can succeed and so our economy can grow. Uh, I noted this morning that the President's economic advisor, Gene Sperling, said that in the first three months when President Obama was sworn into office, we lost 2.3 million jobs. That is what he faced walking in the door and we have been trying to dig out of that hole ever since. I would say, Mr. President, that um, symbolically this, is, this agreement or that we are working on here is moving us to the point where we are having the final interment of John Maynard Keynes. He nominally died in 1946, but it appears now that we are going to put him to his final rest with this agreement. Keynes was a British economist who uh, kind of turned the world upside down when he started arguing that just the force of the markets is not enough to resolve problems when we face recession and depression. We need to play a more active role, uh, a more assertive role in increasing aggregate demand uh, by programs. Now, one of the great disciples of that point of view was Franklin Roosevelt, who when he came to the presidency in the midst of the Great Depression, believed that we needed to create jobs and work, infrastructure work across America uh, to put more money into our economy. That uh, was a positive force that helped to bring us out of the Depression. Some argue it was only a halting effort until World War II started, but the fact is that was accepted theory, economic theory in America for many decades. But now take a look at where we are today. We have a problem, an obvious problem, with too high unemployment, lack of consumer demand and confidence, and a reluctance by many Americans to make purchases of goods and services that would create a demand for um, more work, more jobs, more economic growth. The President came to office and said, well, the first thing we need to do is to move this economy forward, and he passed the stimulus package, which I supported. The stimulus package, I believe 40 percent of that stimulus package, went into tax cuts for families. So they would have more spending power, particularly lower and middle income families. Uh, he also put money in infrastructure, uh, trying to make sure that we move forward building in America for our future, and money to help state and local governments that were clearly struggling with cutback in revenue. 
That was the President's stimulus package. It was helpful, but it clearly did not turn the economy around as we had hoped. We are moving in the right direction. The next thing that the President did last December was reach a bipartisan agreement, a controversial one, to extend tax cuts in this country. The obvious belief was that if we continue to put spending power in the hands of working families who have a lower propensity to save with every marginal dollar, they'll spend it and help the economy get back on its feet. So that was the second phase of the stimulus. What we are talking about now in terms of our future, the next 10 years, and what we'll do specifically for the next year and a half, is to do the opposite. It is to take money out of the economy by reducing government spending. That is a way to reduce the deficit, at least it appears to be, but yet it really flies in the face of this notion that we can increase aggregate demand, increase demand for goods and services, and create jobs. I was a member of the Deficit Commission, the Bowles Simpson Commission, and that commission was very careful not to put into place the spending cuts for at least a year until we were back on our feet and the economy was moving forward. Their fear, and the fear that I share, is that if we make spending cuts at this point, it will not help economic recovery. In fact, uh, many would agree. I think Paul Krugman regularly reports that point of view in the New York Times, and I, I think he's right. So here we are on the horns of a dilemma. In order to avoid the disaster that would occur August 2nd, if the United States defaulted on its debt for the first time in its history, we are being told we have to cut back on government spending, and by cutting back on spending, we may also have a negative impact on our economy. Uh, I'm afraid this dilemma is not going to serve our purposes very well. I'm not sure this is clear thinking. I think in many respects it's ideological thinking. The Republican point of view has always been reduce the size of government at any cost to the economy. They believe in their heart of hearts in the pre-Keynesian view of the world, that the market will work this all out if we just get out of the way. Well, that may be possible, but it's going to be a very costly experience and a costly experiment as people find themselves struggling through this recession without a helping hand. For example, will we extend unemployment benefits as part of this conversation uh, about what we'll do with the economy for the next year and a half? I, for one, would argue we should. My understanding is they expire at the end of this year, and if that's the case, the extension of unemployment benefits will cut off direct payments to people that we know are the first dollars spent. Families on unemployment spend it all, because this is what they live on. And so that stimulus to the economy may be cut off. Would the senator yield for a question? I will. Act let me complete one thought, okay. and then I'll be happy sure. to yield. Secondly, the president has put in a payroll tax cut. What a payroll tax cut means is that working families get about 2% more each pay period. Now, the belief is, by the President, and I share it, that that kind of a helping hand ends up with dollars in hand for many families spent into the economy. I hope that we extend the payroll tax cut as part of this agreement. Now, it doesn't serve specifically the need for deficit reduction, but it certainly serves the need for us to stimulate the economy and have people buy more. Right now, we have a crisis of consumer confidence, and I think it is brought on by the bad news out of Washington. We have to share some of this blame. It is brought on by the fact that many people overborrowed before the recession set in, many times going deeply into debt. For example, in the 1990s, the average indebtedness of a family was 84 percent of their annual income. It reached, in, by the year 2007, about 125 percent, a 50 percent increase in indebtedness. And now families facing that indebtedness are retrenching, holding back, not making commitments. And it's coming down to 112 percent and slowly back to where it should be. What we're trying to do is to give people some spending power to create more consumer and aggregate, aggregate demand for goods and services for business growth in this country. So I hope that as we look at this deficit reduction package, as important as it is, we understand that we are doing it at an economically dangerous time. When this recession still threatens us, when many people are still held back because of their reluctance to spend, and if we do not provide a helping hand in this, kind of, in this situation, uh, I'm afraid the economic recovery may be even slower. The political realities tell us that we're faced with this dilemma, either a default on the debt ceiling or cutbacks in spending, either one of which would be harmful to the economy. 
I hope that we can find a way through this that is sensible, not just from a political point of view, but an economic point of view. And I yield to my colleague from California for a question. I have a few questions. Because what you are doing right now is, is stepping back and looking at a bigger economic view of where we are. And having come off of an election in 2010 where the, frankly, the only issue that I face day after day is job creation, I think my friend is right to talk about that. But here we are in a crisis that is made up. We have raised the debt ceiling 89 times, and I know my friend has looked at all of this, uh, and isn't it true that never before have we been at a circumstance where one political party has held the full faith and credit of the United States hostage to some agenda that they want to bring to the country. Is that, is that my friend's understanding? There has never, I would answer, there has never been an instance since 1939 in the 89 times when we have extended the debt ceiling, except for one technical period in 1979 for a few days, there's never been a time when we used the debt ceiling as a political bargaining chip, and there's never been a time when we were this close to defaulting on the debt and a true concern across the country and the world that the United States would not keep its promise to pay its bills, which, as the Senator knows, could result in a loss of confidence in our economy an increase in interest rates, not just for the government, but for businesses and families everywhere at exactly the wrong time. Okay, so what we've now established is that at a time of economic uncertainty, what the Republicans have done as a party is hold this whole economy hostage. We've established that. It's never been done before. It's a made-up crisis. They know under Ronald Reagan the debt ceiling was raised 18 times. Under George Bush, it was seven, eight, or nine times, and they never said a word. But now, in the midst of this crisis, the economic crisis that we've had going on, this recession, they add this horrific crisis that they have made up. So I, and, and I have one more question I want to ask my friend for his comment. You know, I was thinking the other day how things are stalling the economic growth, the recovery is stalling. And I look back on this and I, and I say, you know, why has this happened? And one of the great reasons, I believe, as someone who did study economics a long time ago, is uncertainty. And this whole nightmare that we're going through, this unnecessary nightmare, here we are on a Sunday, we know that uh, talks are going on. This is unnecessary. But we're in this mess. The Republicans wanted us to be in this mess again in three, four, five months. We finally, I hope, gotten rid of that notion. We're not going to agree to a short-term extension here. But here's what I see, the bigger picture. As soon as the Republicans took over, they stopped working here on this economy. Not only did they stop working on the FAA conference, the Federal Aviation Administration, but they now have shut down the FAA. They refuse to allow an extension, and there are job losses all over my state, I assume all over your state. They stopped completely, at this time, any work on patent reform, which Chairman Leahy says is hundreds of thousands of jobs. They have put forward a highway bill and a budget that cuts highways by a third, that's 600,000 jobs that will be lost. They voted down here with a filibuster, Mary Landrieu's small business bill, my economic development bill, hundreds of thousands of jobs between those two. And now we have this made up crisis. And how long have they been in? Let's see, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, seven months and we're in a mess. So I say to my friend, as he puts forward this notion that we have to be concerned, it's not only, it's not only that we have this made up crisis, but it's also that they have put the brakes on anything the Senate and the House can do to stimulate jobs. And does my friend agree that it's, it's a very discouraging time? 
Well, of course it is. And I think what's most discouraging is that the average person is asking themselves, why would we inflict this pain on ourselves in the midst of recession? Why would we have the fear of defaulting on America's debt uh, for the first time in our history? Why would we lose our credit rating, the best in the world, triple A, because of a manufactured political debate here in Washington? We'll pay for this for a long time. For every 1% interest rates go up, our national debt goes up $130 billion a year, $1.3 trillion over 10 years. So as we talk about all the spending cuts that we want, the fact is that we end up in a position where we can't really keep up with increases in the interest rate. The majority time has expired. The senator from Arizona. I suggest the absence of a quorum. Uh, Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Continuing the colloquy on this side of the aisle, during the and, and we would give up uh, the floor. Well, that's, a, that's all right. I, I have no objection to the quorum. I'll, I'll, no, no. I, I use the time rather than have to listen to this. Mr. President. The, How much time the, is remaining? Does the senator withdraw or withhold the I, quorum call? I suggest the uh, suspend further <laughs> proceedings uh, under the quorum call. Without objection. Mr. President, what, how much time is remaining? The minority has 14 minutes. 14 minutes. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll be glad to engage in a short colloquy with the senator from Illinois, if he would like. The senator from Illinois believe that we are close to an agreement here? I hope so. And does the senator from Illinois agree that most likely that agreement will not have an increase in taxes associated with it, at least in the short term? I hope not. You hope so? I hope that there is revenue included in any agreement. Well, everything thing that I have heard is that the agreement does not have tax increases in it. Is the senator heard differently? I, I mean, being in the leadership. I, I honestly am not party to this, but I can tell you that as Dang of Six and Fiscal Commission, we believe everything should be under consideration to reduce our national debt. Well, um, so I, I assume that that would also mean that the senator from Illinois would advocate another stimulus package. I want to make sure we have some stimulus to the economy to create jobs and help those out of work find work with training and education. So uh, one would have to assume then that the senator from Illinois believes that the last stimulus package was successful, which was counting interest of over a trillion dollars. The senator from Illinois and others who advocated the, quote, stimulus package said that if we pass this, as did the administration, if we pass this, Unemployment will be a maximum of 8%. This will stimulate our economy and create jobs. And you know what the senator from Illinois and others are saying now? It was not enough. That it was not enough. That we didn't spend enough. That, the, that, we, didn't make the, that we didn't make the deficit larger. Because certainly nothing in the stimulus package was paid for. So I hope that, 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 I, that the senator from Illinois understands, the American people understand, that just spending more money has failed, and failed miserably. When you look at the latest news, and it's on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and, uh, and the Washington Post and the New York Times, that our economy is staggering back into a situation of, of stagnation. With and the response on the other side, I'll, I'll be glad to let you respond, and the answer on the other side is, well, let's have some more spending and let's raise taxes. Let's take some more money out of the taxpayers' pockets in the form of spending more money, their money. It's not, it's not the administration's money. It's not the senator from Illinois' money. It's the people's money. Take some more money of theirs. This, this is the Nobel Prize. Well, I won't. Anyway, take more money in taxes and more, and more out of the taxpayers' pockets, and that will be the answer to our problems. I'd be glad to hear the senator from Illinois' response. First, I want to thank my colleague from Arizona. For those who are witnessing this, this is almost a debate in the United States Senate, and it rarely happens. And I thank you for coming to the floor. <laughs> and I'd like to all... Well, may I say that 
Rather than have you use all our time, I thought I would engage in a colloquy. Well, I enjoy it doing thank this. And I thank you. Go ahead, please. First, uh, during the course of your presidential came, campaign, Mark Sandy, your economist, uh, helped you formulate some positions. His opinion of President Obama's stimulus is that it stopped a precipitous decline in our economy. Did it achieve all we had hoped for? No. Could I just, like, say, could I, could I just, could I just interrupt one second on, on, that, on that particular point? Mr. Zandi was one of many advisors to my campaign. The key advisor was Douglas Holtzaken, who is, as you know, former head of the CBO. You know him well, who had no really brief whatsoever for that proposal. Please go ahead. Well, the second point I'd like to ask the senator from Arizona. I think one of the real bedrock beliefs among Republicans is that if you cut taxes, particularly on the wealthiest people in America, the economy will prosper. We hear that over and over again. Didn't we try that experiment under President George W. Bush? Didn't the debt of the United States double under the President and he left a shambles behind him? 2.3 million jobs lost in the first three months of President Obama's administration because of this failed economic policy, which you continue to espouse, that if we cut taxes on the rich, America is going to get wealthier? Haven't we tried it? Where are the jobs? Could I take a little trip down memory lane with my friend from Illinois who I had the great privilege many years ago, I don't know if I should mention, 1982 election, he and I came to the House of Representatives together. And you might recall that one of his own, then a Democrat congressman from Texas, got together with President Reagan, and guess what we did? We cut taxes, and guess what? We had one of the strongest recoveries in recent history of this country. Because, could I just say, if I'm finally enough, because we didn't start spending and add spending without paying for them. And I would say the senator from Illinois, he is correct. The spending that went on in the previous administration was not acceptable and led to the deficit. Let me just finish. But I would also say, speaking for myself, I voted against the Medicare Part D uh, because it was not paid for. I voted against the earmark and pork barrel spendings, which were abundant as every appropriations bill came to the floor and dramatically increased spending in the worst way, wasteful and corrupt way, I will say. And I'm proud that at least some of us said, if you don't stop this spending and get it under control, then you're going to face a serious problem. But I would also mention, and you've seen the chart, it's gotten a lot worse, it's gotten a lot worse since the last election. And you can't keep BIOB, you can't keep up Blame it on Bush. Go ahead. Uh, I'd like to respond to my colleague through the chair, my colleague from Arizona. Does he recall what happened with the Reagan tax cuts? Because what happened was we tripled the national debt during that period of time, and President Reagan came to Congress 18 times to extend the debt ceiling. He holds the record. So to argue the Reagan tax cuts led to great long-term prosperity is, I think, seriously in doubt if you're going to use the deficit as a measure. If I could say... We believed, and Reagan believed, that cutting tax cuts would restore our economy, which was in the tank, thanks to the practices of the previous administration before him. And we, Reagan presided over probably one of the greatest job creation periods in the history of this country. And those are numbers that I would be glad to insert in the record. Compare that with what has happened since this administration took office, with the promise that if we passed Obamacare, if we passed TARP, if we passed all of these others, that the economy would then be restored and grow. And again, it's hard for my dear friend from Illinois to refute the fact that they categorically stated that if we passed the, uh, the uh, quote, stimulus package, that unemployment would be at a maximum of 8%. Unemployment today is 9.2%, and if you look at any indicator, whether it be housing starts, whether it be uh, the deficit, whether it be unemployed, whether, whatever it is, it's gotten worse since the, since the stimulus package was passed rather than better. Would Please senator, go ahead. Would the senator yield for a question. Does the senator believe... Well, I'd be glad to just hear your comment. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you a chance to speak again. Yeah. Does the senator believe that defaulting on our national debt for the first time in our history, which has been the threat looming over us from the House Republicans and others for a long period, is good for America's economy? 
One of his colleagues on the floor here from the state of Pennsylvania has come in and said, listen, defaulting on the debt is not that big a deal. It can be, quote, in his words, easily managed. Does the senator from Arizona agree with that thinking? As the senator may know, I came to the floor a couple of, day, <laughs> a couple of days ago and uh, made the, the comment and that uh, the senator from Illinois and I are in agreement. Point number one, you, you can prioritize I think the senator, and, and mo every economist that I know literally would agree, you can prioritize for a while where you want what remaining money is left, but the message you send to the world, not just our markets, but to the world, that the United States of America is going to default on its debts is a totally unacceptable scenario, and beneath a great nation, we are in agreement, number one. Amen. Num no, no, number two is that to insist, to insist, that any agreement is based on the passage through the United States Senate of a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution of the United States, as I said before, is not fair to the American people because, because the, the, in, the, the terrible obstructionists on this side of the aisle, the terrible people, their, their, their flawed philosophical views about the future of America is not going to allow us to get 20 additional votes from your side, assuming that you get all 47, since it requires 67 votes to pass a balanced budget amendment of the cost. Mr. Constitution. President, it pays. So I think it was not only wrong assessment, I think it's not fair to the American people to say that we can pass a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution through the Senate at this time. Now, maybe after the senator is defeated in the next election and we <laughs> get rid of a lot of <laughs> that, maybe that'll happen. But certainly, let's not tell the American people that that is a possibility today, because I think it raises their expectations in a way that's not fair to them and, frankly, detracts from what I think is being done as we speak between the leaders, the president, Democrat leaders, and Republican leaders, which is in a very short time frame. Go ahead. I would just say it pains me to say that I agree with the <laughs> senator from Arizona, but I do. We both feel that threatening the debt ceiling is not in the best interest of the United States, and both of us feel that holding out the threat that if you don't pass a constitutional amendment, you can't let the economy continue is really not a good faith bargain. I wish Senator Byrd were here to respond to that particular suggestion. And as for my prospects in the next, next election, I thank the Senator from Arizona for campaigning against me last time. When he did, I almost got 60% of the vote in Illinois. So I welcome you back to the land of Lincoln anytime you'd like to come. Well, I'd, lo I'd love to come out and uh, as I saw, I, I did so well in the presidential campaign in the land of Lincoln. I'm not surprised that I had such a dramatic impact on the Senator from Illinois' selection as well. Could I just say, uh, this, is, this kind of discussion I think is important, number one. Number two is, we should have this national debate on other thing, forms besides just the Sunday show, and perhaps the, the floor of the Senate is the best place to do that, and I want to continue to engage with the Senator from Illinois. But I hope that this agreement, I hope that this agreement will assure the American people that we will meet our obligations, that we will meet our obligations not only physically, but fiscally, but also meet our obligations to them to govern, to govern, because they did send us here to govern. I think the senator from Illinois would agree with me. The last approval rating of Congress I saw both sides of the aisle was about 16 percent, and I've yet to encounter anyone in that 16 percent category uh, in my travels back to my state. And by the way, I would like to note the presence of the Budget Committee Chairman uh, here, Senator Conrad, who I think has made enormous good faith efforts uh, to reach an agreement on some of these issues. And I thank him for his uh, work, and I want to assure him his reward will be in heaven, not here on earth. Uh, <laughs> does the Senator from Illinois have? I'd also like to thank the Senator from Arizona for the few minutes that we've shared on the floor, and I really hope more members will do this. Uh, rather than just taking turns giving speeches, these exchanges, even when we disagree, are valuable. 
But I hope at the end of the day, I agree completely with the Senator from Arizona. At the end of the day, we cannot allow our economy to lapse into this default. It will be devastating to a lot of innocent families and businesses across America and will cost us dearly in terms of our national debt. So let us hope that we can find this bipartisan agreement that uh, people are working on even at this moment. Uh, and I hope that we can do that soon. Incidentally, I wanted to say for the record, former Senator Alan Simpson, whom I came to know even better, on the Bowles Simpson Commission said, and I quote, Ronald Reagan raised taxes 11 times in his administration. I was here. I was here. I knew him better than anybody in the room. He was a dear friend and a total realist as to politics. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Just, could I just remind the Senator from Illinois that in retrospect, the one thing that, Senator, that President Reagan said he regretted, and he regretted, was the agreement that was made with, uh, with the Democrat leadership that we would cut spending by $3 and increase taxes for $1 for every cut in spending. That was the ironclad agreement. And guess what happened? We increased spending and we did not...